Welcome divas and dudes to the nutrition class. Um, this is the final in the series. Um, we're looking at just how to reinvent, reinvent recipes, really looking at what research has told us about body mass index and waist circumference and how do we just improve um, our, our wellness plan so that we can avoid what really comes with the issues of a sad American diet. So the SAD diet, um, which really has caused so much disease, so morbidity and mortality rates in our country from the SAD diet. And just as a quick little review, I'm going to take you through a couple slides just so we can get on point. And I've, I've, I've been adding a review into the segments uh, throughout the, the month because I just feel like it's good to hone in on what it is we're talking about. What does science teach us? How do we use the science? You know, how do we apply it to um, our own personal lives? And then today I'm going to be showing you a couple of case studies. And so you guys, uh, some of you sent me in um, your journals, your information of, you know, the, the base, like, you know, what do I eat before I'm being tested? So just like in the research uh, studies, we want to get a baseline. And so um, I used two um, cases. And so I, I think it'll be fun to see how those kind of line up with what we've been learning. So when we think of reinventing our recipe for wellness. What I really want us to think about is recipe of foods, but also recipe of how do we build our day? And we've been talking about this quite a bit throughout the month, thinking about how, how do we exercise? I love that Shirley just takes the stairs. That's just her, her commitment to every little step matters. And I think that's so brilliant because it really does. Every calorie matters and every step matters. And so reinventing our recipe for life is really what I want us to think about. And ultimately it's because we have one of the sickest nations in the country. So why is it that we have the best medical um, fields, we have the best medical technology and service people, and yet we have so many people that are sick? Um, and so being able to reduce our risk of chronic disease obviously means we want to be able to enjoy life better. I still love the story of Jack LaLanne. Uh, he, you know, had an amazing life. He was definitely um, an enthusiast before his time, you know, really teaching about Three meals a day, don't snack, he used to say, and uh, square meals were really important. You know, back then it was the four food groups, which, you know, we've, we've maybe improved on that. I don't know, now that we've got multiple food groups and maybe it complicates things. But Jack LaLanne was just such a great inspiration because he exercised every day. He had uh, a, a long marriage, which I think is super cool, too. Um, and so he lived and then he died and it was nothing in between. So that's what we always hope and pray for is getting rid of the, um, the morbidity, so the sickness that allows us to you know, gradually suffer and finally decline. So um, the little apple there has got two meanings. We wanna avoid the apple shape when it comes to human physiology, and we wanna eat more apples too. So if we think of what the research has really been uh, working um, through, I think the best take home message is what happens with our metabolism when we eat poorly and we exercise poorly. It changes our physiology. We are born to move. We are born to be active. And what did we do in our, in our, you know, smart world, our smart culture, we sat more, the smarter you are, the less you have to work. You can pay to have your house clean. You can pay to have your car clean. You can pay to have your lawn mowed, right? You can pay your personal trainer to tell you how to work out. But ultimately, we still have to do the sweating. We have to be able to do the work so that our bodies will really still function optimally. Again, we're meant to move. When the abdominal fat expands, um, it goes haywire. So when the fat cells start to increase, um, usually it's from a dietary intervention, a negative intervention. We have the cytokines. So those bad cells start to build up and causing death. So that's what we're trying to avoid. What is HTN? Anybody remember? Hypertension 
cardiovascular disease, and of course the CA is cancer. So those big three seem to be happening more and more when we have people that have a metabolic syndrome. So of course diabetes isn't in that list, and so uh, I was gonna try to make you think of that one, but um, I gave it away. Because diabetes is the, the direct uh, consequence of elevated blood sugar and decreased work or, or effectiveness of insulin. So whenever it's Fulbright, somebody gets diabetes and then they have to take medicine to you know, really try to help their body deal with blood sugar, get nutrients into the cell. If their pancreas can't make insulin anymore, they have to take it uh, either um, by a shot or other medicines by mouth, but usually it's a shot when you have to take insulin. So we don't want that to happen. The cytokines are those dangerous cells that are really starting to cause trouble in our body, which causes that metabolic syndrome. And what we found was that reInvent really started to look at dietary fat as a key to focus on, gosh, the Western diet. We started realizing that, you know, as we looked at the research, protein needs to stay up if we want to what? Hold on to muscle mass, right? Calories can go down. We know that if our goal is to help um, prevent the metabolic syndrome or weight gain, but we knew, we see that fat is such a concentrated source of calories that that becomes a really easy target. If we need to lower our calories, fat becomes a great one. Anybody remember how many calories per gram fat provides? Nine. Nine calories per gram four calories per gram when it comes to a protein and four for carbohydrates. So this whole thing about carbohydrates making you fat is just ridiculous, right? Fats can easily go right to the fat cells. There isn't really a lot of metabolic changes that have to happen by the liver. If we eat fat, it's going to go into our small intestine, bile is going to be added, some lipase, which is the enzyme that breaks down the fats. It goes into the liver and, huh, it's already fats. So it gets packaged and gets sent to where? The fat cells, right? So any calorie in excess can go to the liver and get turned into something that has to get packaged, which you know could be in our, in our fat cells. But fat is the easiest one to get stored because it's already pretty much like it is. So fat became one of the really key elements as we were studying the research, you know, looking at, well, what could we cut out to really make sure that our body is functionally optimally? So the reality is we just don't need very much fat in our diet. And so um, I put that together, this little flyer for you, you know, reinventing um, how our, our foods need to look and just kind of a reminder um, that highlighting the veggie flavors is something that I think we lose sight of. You know, we kind of get the idea that if we're going to saute some veggies, we've got to add a lot of stuff to it, you know. And so one of the challenges I gave you was try uh, sauteing. It's called a dry saute or a steam saute. So adding very little or no moisture at all. And at the very end, a little water to steam and then adding the oil, if any, at the end of cooking. So now you can really see how much is going in there. So that becomes a great way to modify the calories. Um, adding complexity of flavor. So we're sort of taught that flavor should be high salt, high fat, high sweet, right? Those are the taste buds that we think about. And we know a little bit about the meat flavor, which is the umami, um, but that one is kind of more vague and so we, we know that if we add salt, if we add sugar, things are going to taste better. So what I try to help people think about is adding the other flavors on our palate. So we've also got sour and we've got bitter. So those are the flavors that really adding to the sweetness of a naturally occurring vegetable or even the fruit now adds better balance and so our palate kind of likes it. It doesn't always have to be a sweet flavor. Um, texture intrigue, super cool. I hope over the last couple of weeks, you guys have tried some cooking styles. You've done the recipe reinvents that we did last week and taking note that by adding a pop of texture makes the meal so much more interesting. Automatically go for the salt shaker if you've got something that's mm, crunchy. 
also trying to add temperature variation. So in a hot dish, adding something cold at the very end, maybe some fresh cherry tomatoes that you've just sliced and put into your uh, pasta, um, maybe adding fresh uh, baby spinach um, right into the pasta just before you serve it, or um, of course into the rice or the quinoa or the lentils or the beans. Adding texture and, and temperature really is a fun way to add pizzazz. And then, of course, making it pretty. We know that the eyes eat first, and uh, that's why I tried to put lots of color on this flyer for you because we know that the eyes eat first. And if you um, get in the habit of buying fresh, bright colored herbs, wow, it just makes such a difference to add some pizzazz right at the end. Sprinkle of paprika, and then also what? You get the aroma. So now you, uh, your eyes eat first, your nose eats second, and finally your palate. So if you get a really good aroma, chances are you've already made the decision that the food's going to be good. Now the flip side could happen too, right? If it looks all brown, you're going to think, oh man, that's not going to be good. Or if you get a bad smell. So some people hate the smell of cumin or cilantro, and right away it's like, oh, I'm not eating that. You know, even if it was maybe even on the side of the plate, the aroma has, you know, been something that becomes a deal breaker. So aroma, texture, um, of course, the, the flavors uh, and the temperature really adds so much to a meal. And so what science tells us that works, exercise plus calorie restriction. And again, just as a reminder, um, we know that resistance exercise is important. Remember, as we looked through a couple of the studies, we found that if people just decreased their calories, their BMI would go down, their waist circumference would go down, but it wasn't as sustainable weight loss because what happened, their muscle was not sustained. So we don't want the BMI to go down without other changes happening. Remember, the BMI is not a great measuring tool. And you remember why? It only looks at height and weight and weight. It doesn't look at age. It doesn't look at body mass, composition, um, muscle, uh, where your fat is located. So for women, uh, we tend to carry more of our fat right under the skin, whereas men carry it more around the organs. And honestly, around organs is much more dangerous because it's making it harder for those organs to function because it's constricted by the fat cells. So we know that resistance exercise is important to maintain the muscle mass. Um, even when we have a goal for weight gain, we know that we've got to use exercise because it helps the body to put calories in the right places. Have you ever heard somebody that, you know, is on the thin side and they can say, well, I can just eat whatever I want. And I try to really, um, be careful when, when people that are thin say that because whatever you want, hopefully is going to be nutrient dense. Cause I know several of you, um, have a goal for weight gain. And we have to make sure that you still don't accidentally do too many of the wrong calories, right? Because then your muscles won't be able to respond to the exercise and build strong. And you won't have the, uh, the energy wrapped around those cells, which is what we call glycogen. So carbohydrates are super important. And that's what really fuels the endurance activity. So we have learned that fat is an easy target when we're trying to cut down calories because we just don't need very much fat. We do also want to look at exercise and endurance and to fuel that activity, what's the main fuel for exercise? Carbs. Yeah, absolutely. So complex carbs means it's a double whammy, right? Because we get fiber, protein, minerals, and the energy that comes from the carbohydrates. And so that's always going to be a win whenever you can do a complex carbohydrate that hits all the buttons to fuel that endurance activity. So reinvent your recipe for wellness. Um, we want to decrease the calories. We found this out in one of the other studies that we looked at. 30% was key. doesn't have to be a lot. 30%. And so I challenged you to see if you could take fat out of each meal just a little bit, you know, instead of a tablespoon, a teaspoon, um, instead of a higher fat meat, a lean meat, maybe instead of cooking with oil, taking out the oil, it wouldn't take much to decrease by 30%. Still keeping your protein level up. Um, and you know, really when we figure how to calculate our protein needs, um, we are going to try to use our desirable body weight. 
So say you wanted to gain weight, then you want to use uh, the, the desirable body weight that you're shooting for. So if you only weigh 100 pounds and you want to be 150, you calculate your protein needs on the 150. So you have that surplus building block for gaining those good calories, gaining those good um, uh, muscle cells. And then again, decreasing the fat is the easier approach. And I say that, but I know that the flavor is in the fats, right? It's like, well, that's where all the good flavor is. So it becomes really strategic where we put the fat so you get the most flavor for your calorie buck. So reinvent means take down the fat. And of course, adding fiber is the win-win because that helps to fill you up. Um, fat calories do... Um, sometimes make you feel more satiated, but it, it takes quite a bit. For example, I bet most of us could eat a whole avocado and not be full, right? And a whole avocado is a lot of fat calories and not very much fiber. But if we did a half of an avocado and we put it on a salad with some quinoa and some spinach and maybe even a little drizzle of olive oil, same calories, whole avocado, salad with avocado, we'd feel a lot more full on the salad because again, more bulk. Fiber is king. <clears throat> Excuse me. So highlight the veggie flavors, add complexity with citrus, add texture and make it pretty, just like I said. And we learned that sauces do so much. So did anybody try any of the sauce recipes? I hope you did. Um, they are so great because when you can figure ways to make um, sauces that are low in calories, that are rich in nutrients, now you've got a win-win. Try to make them plant-based, try to add fresh flavors. Um, I just went to a, a Master Gardener's class and I bought some fresh herbs and we, we had to wait until fall, fall temperatures to really start planting all of our leafy greens and lettuces. Um, did anybody get a little rain over the weekend? Very little. Very little. Finally, Bernie got a good amount. So the ground is still wet, it's still 92 degrees, but um, so we're getting close. I'm just now getting ready to till my um, raised beds and put some good soil in there. But um, fresh flavors from herbs are going to be such an easy win. And, you know, adding to your magic bullet or a food processor so you could add the fresh herbs along with maybe a, a fl another flavor vehicle. Um, sesame tahini is such a good one. I hope you try it. Um, experimenting with that. Of course, the cashews, both of those are not gonna be um, fat free. They're just oil free because again, they're made from a, a base of a nut. The tahini is made from a sesame seed. And of course the cashew cream sauce is from the cashew. So you still have to use them sparingly, but the recipes I gave you encourage you to add a tiny bit of water and of course the herbs. And so you don't need much to get a big load of flavor. And we found that frozen veggies are great. Remember I did that rice dish where um, we just added more frozen veggies. So if you feel like, wow, is there something I could do to decrease or dilute the total number of calories, especially from fat, I could add fiber. Well, you could use frozen veggies. It's a really easy approach. So I personally have been increasing my freezer stock of frozen veggies because it's an easy one. I just bought frozen Brussels sprouts. Never have done that before. I always only did fresh, um, but I'm excited to use them because certainly the nutrient content is high in frozen vegetables. They take them right out of the field. They wash them, they blanch them and they freeze them. So it's an easy win. Um, I've used frozen broccoli a lot, but um, you know, I hadn't really ventured outside of frozen broccoli. So now I've got Brussels and zucchini and carrots, and then a couple of the blends with cauliflower. So it's been really fun just to add that to the plate. I have to tell you a story. I, I went to a, a, um, a meeting, a leadership meeting at my church, and the lady ordered lunch. And I thought, oh no, right? Of course, it came from Bill Miller's, and there were green beans, pinto beans, potato salad, and like four kinds of meat, fat, high fat meat. And everybody at the table needed to watch this video series because they, you know, had extra fat around their middle that was going to hurt their metabolism. Of course, I didn't say a thing. I just made my plate sans the meat. And nobody noticed that I wasn't eating any of that stuff. Um, I was new to the group, so I had to be very quiet. <laughs> but it just made me realize that all gatherings, people eat that way. 
you know, fluffy white bread from Bill Miller's and all the sauces. And people were talking about how good the chicken fried steak was at Bill Miller's. And I just felt like I was a fish out of water. <laughs> and they didn't know me very well. So again, I had to, I had to be diplomatic. Um, but I just, it just hit home because I had this video series on my, on my mind and, you know, it's just the way Americans eat. And it's because also it's so convenient. Where can you go get healthy fast food now that Powers Bakery is closed, <laughs> right? It just breaks my heart that there's no such thing as healthy drive through but I did find one. So I'm going to share it with you today. So complex carbs, this is a fantastic product. I want you guys to take notes of, um, I had a new friend over and I made her dinner and I used this dish, um, organic soybean pasta. Um, L I V I V A is the brand name. It was so good. Now, whenever you do these, um, pastas that are made with soy, just really watch them. Um, it gives you kind of a wide range of cooking. I think it was like six to 12 minutes, which is a big range, but I just really kept my eye on it. Stir it, taste it, check it, because if it overcooks, it's terrible. Now we did used to serve this at uh, Paris Bakery and people loved it, but the first couple of times one of my guys cooked it, it was terrible. So again, it's, you got to find that sweet spot when you're using these, but so high in protein, um, 13 grams of fiber and 20 grams of protein. So it's like cha-ching, lunch is served. So what it's a, that, per serving? yeah, per serving. I think it's a one cup serving. Yeah, really great, great product. And again, there's so many new pastas coming out on the market, which is why I, I showcase those in our recipe reinvent, because I want us to use pasta. You know, if, if these little ladies ask my opinion of lunch, I could have helped them do something so much better than Bill Miller's sausage and, and barbecue. But again, that's just Texas. Um, so let's do a couple of case studies. Um, this one was Mary. Um, and she's a great success story. Um, she started just walking to, um, help with her comorbidities. Um, she had cancer in 2002. Um, so it, you know, this is a, a story that's been going on for a while. Um, she had diabetes before the cancer and her BMI was 32. And if you remember that little grid, 32 is in the red. So it goes blue, green, yellow, red, and then orange, something like that. And, um, you know, so anytime we're out of the blue, blue is, um, you know, okay. A little underweight green is just right. Anytime you're, you're past the green, um, going to blue, you have higher risk because it's too thin. And then anywhere when the green and yellow is okay, it's like you're normal or a little bit overweight. And that, that still provides you with very good, um, low risk. And then when you start getting into the other colors, the risks go up. So you can see with her com comorbidities, she definitely had, you know, some struggles and her waist circumference is 43, which is big. Um, and so if you haven't already measured your waist circumference, go just a little above your belly button, about an inch, you'll see a natural uh, curve slightly and that you just find the skinniest spot. And that's where you measure your waist and just track that number, just kind of see where, where it is. And, um, as you make changes, do you see any changes? Because she definitely did a really good job. Her goal was instead of adding weight resistance, she just started doing hills. So walking was her thing. Um, she didn't have a fitness um, membership and she didn't like working out in public. So she just added hills, but because of her, her weight, she working hills was a good resistance. It, it used her large muscle groups, which was, you know, lower body. So it definitely helped her. Um, and she just really focused on cutting out hidden fats in foods. So, you know, to sort of simplify the whole landscape of diets and what diet do I follow and how much of this or that, the simplest thing you could do is focus on the macronutrients and find out all the places where you could cut it, you know, and so fats was it. I've had another client where they focused on just adding in protein because they, you know, needed to gain weight, just adding protein. The fat will follow but you can really be careful when you're adding protein if you, if you try. So Bill Miller's, I don't even know if they have a super lean brisket. They probably do, but the sausage would not have made that cut <laughs> if we were trying to cut the, cut the total fat. Okay. And then always increasing 
veggies allows us to do what? Increase fiber. The other thing it does is help dilute the total calories on your plate. When you make, when you add more veggies, you're inadvertently diluting the calories on that plate. So what did Mary's typical day look like? Well, breakfast was sausage. Oh, if you can see that well, uh, sausage and eggs, um, whole wheat toast. And she was very proud that she used grass fed butter, uh, large OJ, even though she has diabetes. So I had to be gentle on that one. Uh, but she thought it was good for her because it was vitamin C, right? And we're, we're taught that, you know, drink up your juice. Um, and then she didn't put anything in her coffee, which honestly I was glad about because it's so hard to get somebody to extract things from their coffee. It's like, don't change my coffee. <laughs> um, and then lunch, wouldn't you know, Bill Miller's, um, which is why I thought it was so funny that, you know, that's what they served us. Crispy chicken sandwich, small fries, and a sweet tea. That was her favorite. Now she, on her, you know, list, there was other places, but I, I was so impressed that you can go to the website of Bill Miller's and get the, the calories, mm -hmm. you know? And so I don't know if you guys have ever done that, um, but when you go to eat out, you can see, holy moly, I just ate 1,190 calories, right? It's amazing. And it really does sneak up on you because uh, that doesn't look like a big meal. It doesn't look big. It's not bad. You know, people, she thought she was doing pretty good. And then I, I found this little resource for her and it was holy moly, right? Yeah, and the, the tea. She probably got sweet. Uh huh. She did, yeah. and you're right. Very sweet. Yes, they probably have all different. I don't know. Do they have lightly sweet, or can you do half and half? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I didn't ask her that, so. Yeah, they're known for their tea. I know they're known for their tea. Sweet tea. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So, I still hold to my note that we do we do not want to drink calories. If we want to lose weight, we don't want to drink calories, especially when it's liquid like that, where you can just throw it down. Um, so her breakfast was 822 calories, 22 grams of protein, and 42 grams of fat. And that seems like a pretty easy breakfast if you're a typical American and haven't really learned about options. It also kind of makes me think of the keto style diet. Grass-fed butter is paleo, you know, is taunted as healthy. She has her, you know, one piece of toast in there thinking she's getting her carbs for her walk, um, right? But the, the sausage, when I looked at the, it's one of the link sausages, you know, so she, and I think it was even a healthier one, but it was still super high in fat. Sometimes the keto and paleo products that tout nitrate free, um, you know, free range, whatever, it's putting those slogans in front of the fact that it's still really high in fat. Mm -hmm. So that's where I always try to help people look at ingredients, yes, quality of the food yes also how what how do the macronutrients fit into your lifestyle and then the lunch you know 28 grams of protein is not that much considering how many total calories she got yeah because notice too that it was fried so the calories went way up on that you know chicken because it was fried and then the, the french fries on the side and I'm guessing she had ketchup too. I, I'm just going to guess because who eats French fries without ketchup? <laughs> but it wasn't in the picture, so I didn't count it for her. So then we go to dinner. Now she's, it's really interesting too, because this is so common. Mary admits that dinner is all about trying to please the kids. You know, trying to make sure that we eat as a family. We have to eat what they want. Otherwise, they're just going to go out and eat with their friends. You know, and so I get it. But what we do then is get foods that aren't healthy. And so we're not really establishing uh, the principles that we're trying to have at dinner, which is, you know, celebrating health. And I think we as a culture have done that really badly. Uh, we get so involved with taking our kids here and there and everywhere that fast food becomes the only option. And then we no longer cook. We no longer share recipes. We no longer have time around the kitchen table that our parents and grandparents did. And you just lose that connection. Oh, Yes, kids develop bad habits because they, they figure that's what they eat. And then they grow up and run beautiful churches and serve Bill Millers to people that don't need it. <laughs> right? So um, the two teenagers, 14 and 16. Now, the food didn't sound so bad, right? 
she uh, she said her husband always uh, cooks out. And of course me, I'm thinking grill. What do we know about grill? Char, acrylamide, and blah. Smoke, and what? Smoke. And smoke. Yeah, all those toxic chemicals that are carcinogens. Um, I didn't say anything. I just kept quiet because, you know, we have to ease in slowly to these things. I don't want to scare people away. But the reality is there is so many things to think about. So salad. She said that was almost always, you know, they add a salad to the dinner um, and then the grilled meat and then mac and cheese. Like the kids' favorite is mac and cheese. And so that's why I broke them down um, individually. So 442 calories in a cup of mac and cheese, 44 grams of fat, and only eight protein. So the mac and cheese is an expensive use of calories, you know, because so many of those calories are coming from a macronutrient that we don't really need. So figuring out a way to make a mac and cheese that's lower in fat, let's do it. Now, the cashew cream sauce that I shared with you um, is phenomenal. But I, and I hinted how we could make that lower in fat. Anybody remember in our recipe reinvent? Nutritional yeast. Because I, and I learned it by accident because we had a lady that had a nut allergy. And I thought, hmm, I wonder if. <laughs> and so I took out the cashew cream sauce completely and I just added nutritional yeast and coconut cream. Now the coconut cream still had some calories, but nothing like the cashews. And it had a good flavor. So now if you don't have a nut allergy, now we could lower the amount of cashew cream, still get some nice creaminess, all the nutrients from the cashews, get a high protein pasta like that edamame. And you know, now you've got a pretty good win. And then you want a little cheese cause you know, nothing's mac and cheese if it's not a little stringy. So your little bit of cheese put on the top, put it under the broiler, make it look all hot and bubbly and it, it passes, you know, it, it would work. So that's something that I really shared with her um, to help her think of ways to improve on a favorite dish of her kids. Um, and then the bowl of fruit, uh, a bowl of fruit is great, but if you have diabetes, you know, we might want to rethink how could we introduce that fruit in a way that will still have some more fiber. So any suggestions, fruit with fiber? Berries, apples, even melons, all of those have fiber. Keep the skin on is the trick. Um, my wonderful sister-in-law um, buys peaches. She has diabetes and she's very brittle, very high waist circumference. She peels the peaches. I've never seen somebody peel a peach. I said, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, I don't like that part. And I, you know, and I think, gosh, the little things matter. Going up the stairs, leaving the skin on the peach, those things matter. <laughs> um, it might not have been, you know, more than five grams of fiber, but again, those little choices make a huge it's difference. A choice, yes. You know, some people don't like the peach fuzz. Uh, you're right. My brother does not. So you are he right. He's the peeler. <laughs> yeah. So I get it. And the peaches might not be the one that you, you know, use for this example, Nectarine. but nectarines, yeah. yes. And adding other things to your fruit bowl. So if you, if you hate peach fuzz, albeit add nectarines and apples and berries. Mm -hmm. So your blend now is getting to your goal, which is high fiber to kind of mitigate the amount of sweetness from the fruits. Yes. So when we looked at Mary's diet history, um, what I wanted to do was kind of just give you the rough the rough go of it. Um, if we think of what her diet looked like, her 822 calories at breakfast, uh, 1,190 at lunch, and 859 for dinner was 2,049 calories. And that's not that far off from a normal, you know, 2,000 calorie diet. Now, granted, a lot of us are more petite, so we might not need that many calories, but she was also pretty active in her job. Her protein levels, 22, at breakfast, 28 at lunch and 38 at dinner for a total of 88 grams. And then look at her fat, 42 at breakfast, 112 at lunch and 58 at dinner for a whopping 212 grams of fat. Adds up quickly. So Mary is actually consuming four times the amount of fat that she actually needed in, when I did her calculation. So there it is. I mean, it's now you might say, yeah, Suzanne, I never eat fried, you know, sandwiches. Good. <laughs> Don't start. But in the next example, you'll see and, and salads can sometimes be a huge culprit because they have the halo, right? You're eating a salad. It's healthy and it might have some cheese. It might have some pecans, you know, healthy nuts, and it might have some meat and some egg. And pretty soon you're easily at 
you know, the 50 grams of fat in the salad. Dressing. And dressing. Yeah, huge. So in Mary's plan, the calorie restriction by 30% and keeping the protein up is how I came up with a 1700 calorie diet. I, I kept her protein pretty high, 100 grams. She would have done fine even, you know, lower. Her range, 80 to 120. How I got that was looking at her ideal body weight. So look at the calculation up here. She's five foot eight, uh, 62 years old, which isn't really in this per, uh, this equation per se. Um, if we were really technical, we could use uh, the mifflin jor or you know some of these equations that are a lot more technical that do include age. But I wanted you to see kind of the cheat sheet form formula, and if and again I'm I'm we want change. We don't need we don't need it to be so specific. We just know that we have to go down. And that's what you always want to think about. Um, so if her ideal body weight is 140, we want to get like a 30 pound weight loss goal. Um, so let's use 180 as our target for her. And when we look at that, um, that was 180 pounds. If I put that into kilograms, that's 81 kilograms, which is, you know, if we did one gram of protein per kilogram of your target weight, that's how I got the 81. And then I even went up a little more, all the way to 120, if we wanted to go higher protein. Because remember, some of those studies said, make sure the protein stays high. So I went up to as much as 30% of her total calories. That's how I got the higher range of 120. So you think of one gram per kg of your target weight or 30% of your calories. And I know that's a little math, but the reality is look at your journals and Keep the protein about the same because we even noticed in Mary's case, her protein was pretty close. It was the fat. Um, so with her calorie target at um, 1700, I'm showing you there that we you know, reduced it. Um, and, and so based on her height and weight, 2430, and then we want to, of course, go down for the weight loss. So the calorie plan was 1700. Protein was between 81 grams to 120 grams, and fat, you know, right about 51. Very doable. Um, so now, the next one, um, Matt. He was a younger guy. I did a cooking class with him at uh, Powerhouse Bakery. So he and his young wife and his uh, boss had gifted him uh, nutrition and fitness training. Um, he was in the military, and he really had low muscle mass. And for a young guy, you know, it's like, why? Well, you'll see there's some, I think, some pretty glaring things that you'll probably pick up on. His comorbidities were that he had high blood pressure, um, he had high cholesterol, and again, the, the low muscle mass. Um, when we determined his basal metabolic rate or his, his basal needs, um, he was 5 foot 11, 32 years old, um, 201 was his current weight, so that's what CBW is, current body weight. Um, his ideal, based on, you know, his height, was 172. So again, let's stay, take a little step back. When we're looking at um, body mass index, remember, it's just height and weight. And we kind of put a grid in there. So when we think of how we base all those ranges, well, it's kind of based on what is your ideal. And that, again, is a shot in the dark, but it's been calculated over years and years with insurance companies trying to figure out who is the highest risk and who's the lowest risk. So that ideal body weight is uh, for, for females, if you're five feet tall, 100 pounds. If you're a man, 106 pounds at five feet tall. And then you add six pounds for every inch for guys and five pounds for every inch for girls. So that seems like crazy, right? But I promise you, it's not far off. Um, there's always plus or minus 10% if you're, you know, really muscular or you have really solid bones. African-Americans have solid bones, so their uh, percentage goes up. <laughs> yes, solid bones, because they have more muscle mass, too. I remember in college, I loved the fact that we studied um, ethnic variability in body mass. And uh, the Mediterranean, you know, fair skin had the, the thinnest bones and African-Americans had the heaviest bones and more muscle. So that's why they're so good in sports, right? Yes. So as we did his calculation, uh, his goal was to build muscle. So secretly what he needs to do is decrease fat. 
because he has muscle. You just can't see it, right? Because he's got more fat than he really needs. Um, so I made his target weight at 190. So it's not quite as low as the ideal, right? We have to be realistic, but um, it's lower than where he is because I wanted him to see that we have to change your ratio and just increasing protein is not going to be the ticket for you to gain muscle. We're going to have to get your calories down and your ratio different and it's all going to come back from the FAT, fat in the diet. So notice here that um, the calories are 2,590, protein 129, fat 75. So again, based on his, his target weight of 190. And I did that with kilogram body weight and I gave him 30 calories per ki um, kilogram. And again, these are quick little calculations for men, it's 30. For women, it's between 20 and 25 calories per kilogram of target weight. And again, I don't want you to worry about those too much, but if you want me to help you calculate yours, um, just ask me and I'll help you. I'll help you get a target weight because it's kind of fun. Then you start realizing how then you get your protein as priority because it's a, about a gram of protein per kilogram. And then it helps you kind of figure out if your protein is going to be 30% of your total calories. Well, now do a little math and figure out how many calories you should have based on your protein. And it, it's, it's kind of a fun puzzle. It, it definitely is a great way to get a, a, a ballpark. And then you could put it into your calorie, calorie tracking system and see how close you're getting. But notice how customized that is versus trying to go onto my fitness pal and you plug in your information. And they say, okay, you need, you know, 2,800 calories. And it's like, wow, that's more than I ever ate before. Good. I guess I need to eat more calories to lose weight. Right? It didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Now he admitted that he um, did a lot of late night eating. He doesn't eat breakfast, okay? Big mistake, especially when somebody wants to gain muscle. His lunch, wow. Yeah, what a burger. Right? And that's exactly what he said. He goes, I choose the avocado one. Duh. <laughs> and bacon, what's wrong with that? It's on a keto diet. Isn't that okay? I know. I mean, it's all these mixed information confuses people. And, um, and then dinner, his wife cooks. They don't have any kids to worry about. Um, they love lasagna, tacos. They normally have salads. Um, but he loves ice cream. Right? I just found an HEB ice cream. I know this is another bunny trail. But a new ice cream that is 50% of the sugar and 60% more protein. It's made with Mutopia. You have to try it and tell me what you think. It, it's an HEB brand. It's a Mutopia ice cream. Is it good? Hey, we have somebody that's tried it. Okay, so loves to snack when he works on the computer. So the habits here with Matt are really glaring, don't you think? Um, he thought he was doing a good job at Whataburger, but of course that one is pretty obvious. But missing the calories at breakfast means that he's eating in a pyramid. The bulk of his calories are happening late at night when insulin is more likely going to be prominent to encourage fat storage. And that encourages fat storage more commonly around the organs, which causes the abdominal uh, um, adiposity. So yeah. So I thought it was so cool when I did a little bit of research to figure out what a burger, again, they, they no holds barred. They tell you, this is how many calories you're getting. Doesn't give you all the details, which I was a little bummed, but um, you know, the avocado bacon burger is right there. And he said he had the, the meal. Um, so, you know, it's anywhere between 850 calories and 1,660 calories. I mean, <laughs> that's a lot of calories. Now, in all fairness, you could get a Whataburger Jr. for 300 calories. And if I'm gonna guess, it has a four ounce patty, which probably shrinks to three or two <laughs> after cooking. So it might have, and again, I'm just guessing, it didn't tell us how many grams of protein. But um, if you had to eat out, I guess you could, you, oops, sorry. Um, I guess you could choose the Whataburger Jr. But I promise you, and I, I wanna get your thoughts on this, but when you start cooking your own more often and eating low fat, that shouldn't even really appeal to you, or it may not appeal to you. Uh, Cause you could make a burger at home 
and make it so good. And then you wouldn't have to worry about what kind of bun and where do they cook it and, you know, you could add to it. So who knows? But I thought it was really interesting that Whataburger lets you know. So when I did his calculations um, and we looked at his typical day and we tried to, you know, see where the macros are giving us uh, the tally. No breakfast. Yeah, that hurt. Lunch was 1,660 calories. But the protein level, and he was so bummed when I showed him, you're thinking you're doing a good job with that burger, but you're only getting 42 grams of protein for 1660 calories <laughs> and 137 grams of fat. Yeah, crazy high. And he's like, yeah, but avocado is a good fat. <laughs> yes. And then dinner. So, um, and I didn't have her recipe. So I just went on uh, my fitness pal and I picked out a lasagna. So, you know, these numbers are proximate for sure, but he described that it was um, a meat base. It had cheese, so 117 grams of fat, um, only 82 grams of protein. I mean, that still sounds like a lot to me. Usually when we build a meal, we want it to be maybe six ounces of protein at tops. And that would be about 42 grams of protein. And then you add your protein from your complex carbs and maybe some nuts and seeds. So a typical meal should probably be not much more than 55 or 60 grams of protein. So for it to be 82 grams is a lot. Okay. And then of course, ice cream, 422 calories, um, another 81 grams of fat. Yeah. So of course it just went way off the chart. Um, you know, and so when we start to really think about the options that we have in eating out, this is where I thought it was really cool. I did a little searching because I, I purposely picked two um, that ate out a bit because I, you know, I know we can reinvent our recipes at home, but what about when we have to eat out? And so I found this place um, and I was really impressed. So Salada, has anybody eaten there before? Yes. Okay, awesome, Jose. So I couldn't believe it. You can build your own salad. So here's this little app. And um, I, your handout has, I wanted to know, gosh, do we have them in Texas or even, I mean, San Antonio? So fortunately we do, because as you can tell, I've never eaten there. But um, what you can do is go to build my salad and you can pick the protein. You can pick the greens. Um, I'm, I'm going to try it here in a minute. I want to make sure it works so before I leave the slides. But so I did it and I added grilled chicken. I did um, the salada greens mix, which was like a mixed greens. Um, I used olive oil and balsamic vinegar. So the salad dressing, you know, I didn't use the creamy. So whenever you can find an, uh, an oil base, you're much better off because the salad dressings add easy 20 grams of fat, you know, and it's like you haven't even gotten started. Um, but then I added some fruit, so some apple with a skin on, added broccoli, cabbage, even threw in some edamame for extra fiber. And then it gives you the nutrition information of the salad. And so I just thought it was so cool. So I, without really trying, honestly, I got 430 calories, 19 grams of fat and 40 grams of protein. So not too bad. I didn't even have to switch around too much, but you know, I mean, Adding the chicken, of course, bumps it. If I was eating really myself, I wouldn't have had chicken. I would have had to find another way to get more protein because the edamame isn't as high. But every time you add something in this little app, and Jose, you know this, um, it'll tell you how much protein, carbs, sodium, sugar, everything. So it's they've spent some money on this app, and it's, it's really uh, a, a trip because you can watch your salad add up the calories. And so if you're, you know, really trying to cut down on total fat, you can do it. Um, I could have um, added in seeds and nuts, but of course I would have got my fat calories up too. So even though the protein from the seeds and nuts are wonderful, the fat calories have to be counted. So, you know, another scenario might be to use a fat-free dressing, not even get the calories from the olive oil, and then add in the seeds and nuts. Now at home, I use a balsamic vinegar and I don't really use the oil. And since I've been doing this month, I've been really trying to find out where I can cut down fats. And my little olive oil decanter hasn't moved much <laughs> because I'm trying to not use it. Um, so I end up using a really high quality balsamic 
and putting crunchies in there. So that's where the fruit is so good in a salad because it, you know, gives you a little bit of uh, variation. So, so, so good. So I just think that raising the stakes is kind of a fun uh, play on words because, yeah, you can put steak in your salad. But I also think raising the stakes of how we eat out becomes such a great piece of information because if we really try, we can look for that information. But I always want to leave you with the other point, and that is, you know, if you're with family and you're traveling and you don't really have a choice, you can always go small. You know, the Whataburger Jr. You can eat small amounts. You can certainly at a restaurant setting, you can kind of customize like you do in the, the salad place asking for sauces on the side and asking for extra veggies. And so I'm, I'm confident that you guys know how to do that. I wanna see if it'll work here to go to my fresh salad takeout. Yes, it does work. Um, so I wanted to, in the couple minutes we have, I wanted to try to build a salad with you. So here we are on Build My Salad. Rats, it's not gonna let me do it. Yeah, okay. I wasn't sure if it was gonna let me actually be interactive. Let me try it one more time. Yeah, not too. Okay, so promise me you're gonna try it on your own. Um, and, and that's why I gave you the little pictures on your handout so it'll remind you. And um, you know, since I won't get to see you in October, I'm ready to make a date. If anybody wants to join me at a salada and uh, we can try putting our salads together and uh, see what the nutrition facts are as we come up with our own nutrition facts. It, it'll let you print it or even email it to yourself so you could go totally um, paperless and uh, you know share what kind of salad you built. And then it'll give you the ingredients so then when you go to the salad place, you can have your uh, items all ready to go. So, okay, well, thank you so much and I'll see you at La Salada. Mm -hmm.